Hi, everyone, and welcome to Pay Dirt, a Penn State football show. Along with former Penn State and NFL quarterback Matt McGloin, I'm Tom Hannafin. This show is brought to you by our sponsors, Funk Brewing, the official craft beer partner of Pay Dirt. Now, we're big fans of Funk Citrus IPA and Silent Disco IPA. However, we want to let you know about some Funk Brewing beers that are available this month. The Silent Luau Hazy IPA is out right now in Funk's tap rooms in Emmaus, Elizabethtown, and York, and it's on the way to your favorite grocers and beer distributors. Also, the the cruising Belgian style white ale is available as of Monday, June. 20th. You can find a variety of Funk Brewing beers at your favorite beer distributor and grocery store. Visit funkbrewing.com to learn where and how you can get their fantastic products. Must be 21 years or older to purchase. Please drink responsibly. Also, Pay Dirt is brought to you by our partners at Bet Online, who continue to be the number one source for all your betting needs and sports info. Find all the latest odds and news and sports developments, including this year's NBA Finals, the NHL Eastern Conference Finals, Major League Baseball, the latest fighting news, and even next season's early. NFL futures. Head to betonline.ag today or use your mobile device to join and use our promo code BELIEVE, that's B L E A V, to get the bonus and get into the action. Paydirt is presented by Bet Online, where the game starts. And thank you for tuning in on ESPN Radio State College, as well as checking out the podcast version of this show, which is presented by the Believe Network. It's available now on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever else you get your podcasts. And of course, hit us up on Twitter and let us know what you think of the show at ESPN Radio 1037 at McGloin QB 11 and at Tom Hannafin. This is our 50th edition of Pater, even though this is only our second time on ESPN State College. We've got a fantastic library that you can check out as part of the Believe Network, B-L-E-A-V dot com. Uh, Matt, this is quite literally our largest episode ever because we have two guests on for the first time ever, two of your former targets in Brett Brackett, and Graham Zuck, I am so excited about this reunion. When you think of these two, what do you think about? You know, the first thing that comes to mind are guys that are loyal to Penn State, that were loyal to the program. Um, both went into Penn State with, with kind of g- different career paths. You got to remember, Brett Brackett was a three- or four-star recruit as a quarterback. Transitioned to tight end, wide receiver, went on to play for a few years in the NFL, and then Graham Zuck was a walk-on um, who – Became a very impactful player all throughout his career. Made a lot of big catches, a lot of touchdown catches. Had a fantastic career. But for me, these are two guys that I look up to. Um, and these were two of you know many guys, but with some of the more important guys, Tom, that allowed that transition for me to become backup to starting quarterback very easy. And it's because they supported me. They had my back. They believed in me. They knew what I was capable of doing. So that when I walked in that huddle, they were behind me. They supported me. And, um, you know, I, I've, I, I've looked up to those guys. Um, when I was an underclassman, I learned a lot from those guys. I learned how to play the game the right way. I learned how to lead the right way. Um, I learned how to be a captain because of these two guys right here. I'm, I'm super excited to have them both on the show today. Brackett and Zug were on campus at a really exciting time to be a Penn State football player because especially 2006 through 2009 and especially 2010 as well uh, when those two uh, finally wrapped up their careers in Happy Valley. There's a lot of success for the Penn State football team and that was predated by not a lot of winning. So these guys got in at the right time. They got to play with Daryl Clark. Obviously you underwent the QB battle uh, and ultimately won the job and you were throwing at these guys. But Um, It's something I want to talk to the guys about is that you had a lot of options at your disposal and you had the the speed of Zug and then you had the size of bracket. Like how easy did that make your life throwing the ball out there? I think all those guys, Derek Moy, right? Justin Brown. um, You you had a lot of guys that complemented one another very well. Um, And one of the things, Tom, that was special about that that 2010 team, and I know we had our ups and downs that year, won a few games, lost a few games, um, but like those guys didn't care who got the football. I never, I can never remember any of those guys complaining about catches or targets or throwing the ball their way. They were so focused on team and the team being successful and, and the offense getting better and just tell me what my route is. Let me run it. Maybe I'll be a decoy here. Maybe not. Um, but they just believed in the system. They believed in the process. And most importantly, Tom, they believed in Penn State football. And I think that is exactly what you look for 
um, and a Penn State football player, and that's what you should strive to be um, as, a, as a Penn State football player, are guys like uh, Brett Brackett and Graham Zug, true team players. Brett Brackett was able to go on and enjoy some time in the National Football League like yourself. Uh, I'm very curious to hear what Graham Zug is up to nowadays because he was, frankly, a personal favorite for this guy who was playing the high school wide receiver and was like, oh, he's about the same size as me. Maybe, you know, I won't, you know, get a bunch of concussions and, you know, break bones. And I absolutely did all that. Uh, so I'm pretty excited about this reunion. So uh, without further ado, Brett Brackett. Graham Zug and Matt McGloin reunited for the first time in many, many years here on Pater. Uh, this is quite literally our largest episode yet. Joining us now here on Pater, Brett Brackett and Graham Zug, the former wide receivers that were once at the disposal of my co host, Matt McGloin. Uh, I guess I got to field the question how many collective children do all three of you now have <laughs> all these years removed from your playing day? So, Matt, I'll start with you. You've got two now. We have two boys here in the McGloin household. Yes, we do. Okay, Brett, you've got... We've got three. Two okay. girls and a boy. Okay, and Graham, what about you? I got two boys. Okay, did you guys ever think this day would come? <laughs> <laughs> Not as bad as it did, I'll tell you what. It seems like yeah. yesterday we were throwing the pigskin around in college, and now we've got these kids we're chasing around. Oh my gosh. Wild time. So uh, I'm so excited about this because uh, I, I've obviously been a fan of Penn State for uh, my entire life. So getting to see you guys all play and then this uh, quasi reunion, we've never had two guests before on at the same time. So this is quite literally our largest episode. So we thank you both for being on here. Um, I'll, I'll start with you, Graham, in terms of uh, what are you up to nowadays? It's been a minute since Penn State fans saw you suited up. So what's life like nowadays outside of having kids? <laughs> Yeah, it's good, man. Uh, I'm, I got a great job now. I'm a uh, like regional manager for an uh, independent co-op, um, dealing with independent garden centers. Um, and uh, a guy that hired me with my previous job named Pat uh, reached out when he took his job and brought me over to uh, this company called Master Nursery Garden Centers. And I'm loving it, man. It's helping these independents um, compete with the big boxes and and giving them a chance. And I'll tell you what, they're, they're great members of great stores. And um and living in Hershey with my my wife and the two boys, and um, they're great. It's fun. It's great. It's awesome being a dad, and um, I'm fortunate enough both boys are athletic and loving sports. So <laughs> good. Good. They they inherited something. That's fantastic. Um, Brett, how about you? What are you up to nowadays? I'm fortunate to still be kind of attached to something that I started with at Penn State. Uh, I'm now the general manager at Uplifting Athletes. Uh, volunteered for when I was at Penn State. All the Penn State fans are probably recognized. Live for Life that. Uh, the three of us participated in pretty much every summer in college. Mm. Uh, it was a brutal workout. Uh, Worst workout of the year. Worst workout of the year. <laughs> JT had his way, but mm. fortunately, uh, the workouts are not quite the same anymore um, for everybody else that participates. Uh, but it's it's been a blessing to be able to come back and, and do this for a full-time opportunity um, to use the platform of sport to help make an impact on people impacting our rare diseases. So um, really, really fortunate, and it's grown the 26 different colleges now work with professional athletes and um, it's a lot of fun. So uh, and yeah, I'm living in New Hope, my wife uh, and three kids. So uh, my my time is is pretty packed with with just that. I can only imagine. I can only imagine um, now that, you know, so you guys were both on campus, if I'm not mistaken, uh, from 2006 to 2010. Would that be accurate? Yes. Yes. You got it. <clears throat> so you guys literally got to experience college together every step of the way um so brett i'll start with you how often are you and graham uh you know in contact and how often are you in contact with your other teammates from that time frame well here's probably the embarrassing part is not only did we do college together we actually lived together um so graham and i were roommates for a couple of years and the unfortunate part is uh we have not kept in touch i think that's the one the one unfortunate part when you're in college the locker room is that home home base right every day you interact with all 120 guys. It's, it's one of the best times of your life because you see them. And, and college was a unique aspect where it wasn't this, you know, turnstile where guys are coming in, in and out. I don't know what it's like with the transfer portal now, but it was, you became family with these guys. Um, and then life happens, right? You go on, you have kids and your time is really committed to your family and your, and your job. So um, it's great to see Graham's face and hear his voice. And I'll bring back a lot of great memories of just hanging out in 4505 and in the apartments. And, um, but you know, it's, it's, it's still good to try to keep in touch with guys as much as we can. 
um, from different classes when you can. And, you know, Matt talked about a golf tournament, a bunch of guys do things like that throughout the summer and just trying our best to show up when we can. And what the, the great part is that I, I can't speak to any guy that I run into that it's not like you're right back to where you left off um, when you're in that locker room. So um, amazing times. And uh, when we can, I know it's uh, a real great thing to get back together and just, just chat it up. Graham, what about yourself, your communication with your former teammates? Yeah, I, would, I mean, I would say exactly what Brett said. I think it's something that, man, any one of us would kill to be back in that locker room and have communication with all of our, you know, our, our brothers and friends that, that we built in that locker room and on the field together. And, um, but yeah, like life comes quick and uh, it's tough. I mean, it's, it's tough. Some guys are, are down in Tampa. Um, guys are in Jersey. They're all, we got guys all over the place and we're fortunate enough that we do have guys all over the place that we can keep in touch with from, from time to time. And, um, but you know, it's difficult. And, and I think hopefully we all realize that. And, you know, if it's one time a year or once every other year, every so often, you know, that special moment is still, is still something that, that we value. And it's not that we don't care about each other. It's, it's, it's just, it's difficult, man. We, we do anything. If, if we heard something bad and somebody needed help, we'd be there in an instant. Um, but you know, I've kept in touch with some, I think when I go back to games, um, we catch up and it's amazing how we can throw five years of what we've missed in in like a 10 minute segment. (laughs) That's beautiful. Okay. Now I don't want McGloin to have to <clears throat> pat himself on the back, but so I'll, I'll have you guys do it for him. When the Scranton slinger walked on campus uh, in happy Valley, Graham, what was your first interaction with Matt? And then what was your, you know, what did you think of him as a player when you were sharing the locker room with him, sharing the field with him? Hey man, I'll be honest. Uh, when, when Matt came in and, you know, he was a, a walk on similar to, to how I began my career. Um, and you know we have nothing but respect for each other, and and, and any walk on for that, and for that matter, and and any scholarship player, I think as a walk on, you look up to those scholarship players, and you look for guidance, you look for for mentoring. Um, but when you get another another walk on, it's just something special. It's it's that kind of killer instinct, and I, I know um, from my experiences looking at Matt when he first got there. I mean, I don't know if he'll be saying it now, but there wasn't a throw he didn't think he could make. And, uh, and <laughs> no, honestly, he still thinks uh, that. No, that's not changed. <laughs> well, yeah. and, but I would say I don't think he – well, he thought that, but I don't think there was a throw he couldn't make. And, and he backed it up. So I think it was something as soon as he went out there and started doing these things and showing us, it was like, man, this, this guy can play and he's going to play someday. He just needs his chance. And – um, you know, I think look back to like our senior year, well, Brett, Brett's in my senior year. Um, you know, I, I really thought Matt, Matt won that job and was ready to go walking into week one. And, um, you know, I, I, I really did. And I think um, he did a good job of earning that opportunity. And, um, you know, I think the thing is when you get that level at Division One, everybody's competing. It's, it's tough. And, um you know, it's a tough decision to make, I'm sure, for coaches and, and all that. But I, I definitely thought Matt did a great job. There was nothing that he did. He left off the table that didn't give him an opportunity. Brett, you were a leader, uh, especially in the 2010 team, but you were definitely a leader for a number of years there. As you're watching the quarterback battle that Graham was just talking about, what was your perspective? Because all you guys had a front row seat for it. Usually when you get in situations like that, when you have two talented quarterbacks, fighting for a job, something good comes of it, right? And and we were lucky enough to get two good quarterbacks out of that. You know, unfortunately for Matt, he didn't start the season as a starter, but like Graham talked about his his mentality coming in, I mean, that was with him throughout. And so when his time came, he was ready. I mean, I can vividly remember that Minnesota game, Rob goes down and Matt just comes in and do, does what he always did and just let it rip, you know? He had no fear. <clears throat> he was confident in himself. He was confident in the game plan. And you know, that's why the coaches stuck with him because it, it, it kind of changed the, the impact that our offense had when he came in. It was just the, the team fed off him um, and, and it was just um, something different. So it was a nice change up that time of year. Matt and, and seized the opportunity and he deserved it, like Graham said. Uh, I certainly appreciate your kind words. And like, guys, guys, I just have to say, well, and it's been a while since, you know, since I've had the chance to talk to you guys and, you know, just, you know, it's funny. Yeah, you guys were so good to me at Penn State. You were so fair to me. You took me under your wing. You showed me the utmost respect. And I was somebody who was years younger than you. 
I mean, you guys were professionals in college and like to those listening, these guys right here paved the way for guys like me to learn how to lead in the years after they left. And I think that's something that gets lost in today's game in the college football world today. Like I understand people, you focus on development, you focus on becoming a good player, right? That's obvious. That's part of the game. That's what should happen, right? That's what the game is. But what's just as important is having Brett Brackett, having Graham Zug, having those type guys lead the way about how to do this, how to do that, how to do it the right way, how to be a balanced student athlete, how to be a good person, how to be a good player, a good teammate. And to me, that is and always will be Penn State football. And that's what a Penn State football player should strive to be. And again, we talked about earlier, this is one of the reasons why I love doing the show, because I get a chance to reconnect with these guys who, who've had a massive impact on my career. And I don't know if I've ever had the opportunity you know, to tell you guys that, but I'm, I'm very appreciative that I've got to know you guys, got, got to play with you guys at Penn State um, and learn from you guys. And, you know, I guess the first question I want to ask you, you know, and because I'm always curious to know, like it's, you know, Hey, what, what memories do you have? What's the first thing that pops in your mind, but it's so important because you guys have been out of school now over 10 years. So Brett, I'll start with you. When you do look back now, when we're talking, you know, Penn state football, it's the first thing that comes to your mind. Today is probably the big 10 network just put out um, a story about, you know, myself and uplifting athletes. And the first clip that shows up is the touchdown pass you threw to me in the back of the end zone against Northwest, and we're down 21 nothing going into yeah. right before halftime. And we ran a, a stick nod. Yes. You, put it, you put it where either I could get it or nobody could get it. The Brian Peters was the safety there from Northwest, who ended up having a, a really strong NFL career with the Texans and a few other teams. You just put it there. like, And that kind of like we went into halftime 21 7, and then you just came out with this look in your eye, dude. And like, I think that was Joe's 400th win, wasn't it? It was, yeah. Let, yeah, left toe yeah. drag you had back of the end zone. I'll never, yeah. I'll say, so just, you man. got so long. Somehow you got like you're six five, six, six, whatever you yeah. are. But like you look like Stretch Armstrong, dude. Like it was it was it was yeah. an awesome catch. And you're like lower, your lower body just went limp. Just didn't move. Yeah. It was it was awesome. Yeah. And then in the in the video, it's literally like I I, I drag and catch it, and the first thing you see is five. Right, right, right into the clip, and he's he's throwing his hands up and running over, and just like it, I mean, it's just I, I just really weird that like that video comes out earlier this week, and you hit us up to do this, and it's just I mean, these are this is what I'm talking about. You go back, and it's like these are the greatest things, great, really amazing time of our lives. Yeah, how, how about you, Graham? What comes to mind? Man, there's so many memories. I, mean, I it's hard to pick just one. Um, I mean, even just uh, I'll go to the opposite way. So Brett went Brett Brett went more in game. I'll think more outside game. I mean, the bowl games, those, those bonds built the bowl games. I'll never forget the time, um, you know, that's <laughs> against Florida where we rented those scooters, Matt, and we, we went all around and we were driving those scooters all over. Um, where was it? Um, Tampa, Clearwater, something like that. And we went over the one bridge and all the cars were lined up behind us because we were holding up all the traffic. <laughs> um I mean, some of those things, those bonds are kind of just what stuck with me. I mean, those memories, I, I, kind of remember those memories with, with you guys more than I remember the, the in-game stuff. Um, I mean, those things, I, I think it's kind of now to the point where you look back and it's kind of like, you know, we're jealous. Like, that that life was awesome. We were, we were so spoiled to be able to hang out with 130 guys that were your best friends and um, every single day. And even though it was work, it was still fun. It was still good memories, and and now you know we're fortunate. We all have great families and kids, and we get to spend it with them. Um, you know, so so hopefully we can kind of carry those memories with them. But man, you look back at those memories; it's just it's something special. You know, when you guys look back like now and like comparing ten years ago, twelve years ago to today, and like Brett, like your journey and your career, you start as a quarterback. And they wanted you to make that change to go to tight end. Like, did that take convincing or were you open to it? And I mentioned today because the way the portal is today, if they asked you to do that today, would you have left? Because, because think of this as well. If you didn't make that change to tight end, do you get four years in the league? Do you get that NFL chance? Like, I mean, I can't stress how difficult that must have been for somebody like you to go to quarterback be recruited as a quarterback and now, Hey, we need you to play the tight end in the slot. And Oh yeah, we're going to need you to succeed at it as well. Yeah, that, that was a big, you know, a, a big decision that I didn't realize how big it was at the time that I had to make it. And 
um, I was getting advice from both sides of it, you know, and um, for me, what stands out is the fact that along the process, the rec- or along the recruiting process, I was told to, to look at the school, look at the academics, look at the people, look at the, you know, vicinity to home. And if your family's going to have access to games and, and all the big picture, obviously. Right. And, and you look at Penn State football, the tradition, there's not many in the area or in the country that are going to compete with that. So that checks the box right. But look at everything else. So when that happened and I knew coming in that there were two quarterbacks. Right. So Pat Devlin, highly recruited quarterback. I knew coming in, I, I was I was not better than him. Right. So you go through the first camp and I'm low on the depth chart. He, we're both redshirted. And I just wanted to play football for Penn State. It didn't matter to me if they wanted me to hold PATs, if they wanted me to play linebacker, if they want whatever they wanted me to do. In the in the process of recruiting, I was the first one to commit in my class because I knew that's where I wanted to be. I just it didn't matter what it took. I wanted to do that. And um, it, it's fortunate. I think it was a Bo Pelini or somebody recently did an interview about guys, you know, sticking, you know, through the recruiting process. I didn't want to get recruited for anything besides quarterback. Wouldn't look at, wouldn't look at tight end, wouldn't look at athlete, nothing. If you're going to recruit me, recruit me as a quarterback. You know, it worked out that way that I got to go to a pretty great school because of it. But then the switch happened and not a lot of people are doing that. Like you mentioned today and you mentioned it, I would not have had the opportunities that I had if it wasn't for it. I may, ne- I may never have saw the field, right? Yeah. Um, and I just wanted to help the team, do the best I could. And I didn't know what could have came after. I was just really focused on doing the best I could right there and then. And I love hearing that, Brett, because like, I think, I mean, uh, I mean, obviously maybe we're a bit biased because we played at Penn State, but I just think it takes, it takes a different person. It takes a special type of athlete to want to be a part of that university. And, and Graham, for you, like you mentioned it earlier, you went the route that I went with the non-scholarship route, right? You're a great high school athlete, couldn't get the offer that you wanted. How important was it for you to go to Penn State and only to Penn State? Right. But, but not just, not just do that to play there, to contribute, to play well, become a leader, become a guy that people turn to for advice. I mean, you were, you were a coach uh, amongst players. Yeah. Well, first, let me go back to the the question with Brett. I mean, I I know that was a difficult decision for Brett, but he always had the team first, Matt. I mean, we know that he he was going to do whatever it meant. I know he said he just wanted to play, but he wanted to help the team. And, um, I'm just glad he switched because it enabled me to get the number five that I always wanted. And, <laughs> and Matt, you should be glad. Matt, you should be glad he quit because, or he quit. He went to tight end because that was one less quarterback you had to compete exactly. with. Exactly. Our senior yeah. year. So, um, but no, for me, I mean, it was. I always wanted to go to Penn State. Um, I grew up going there since I was like two years old. My my dad went there, so I always wanted to go there. I didn't think it was ever going to be possible. Um, I really didn't. And Penn State back then with walk-on type guys, if you weren't, you know, Brad or Pat or one of those guys, they were always late to the table with recruiting. It was kind of Joe's thing. And um, not that he wasn't actively looking at you. It was just he was kind of later to the recruiting game and it worked out for him. Um, But I always wanted to go there. So when I got there, again, I kind of had that mindset like you did of whatever it was that I wanted to prove myself and I knew I could play. Um, and if it worked out at Penn State, it worked out. If not, I still was at Penn State with 130 of my friends. Um, but then I kind of started getting my chip on the shoulder and hearing the guys on defense when I was on scout team and we were redshirted and, you know, tearing them up, you know, and I started hearing the defensive players talking about me. Now I'm thinking, okay, maybe I can do this. Um, and then I was fortunate enough, um, I, I guess, my sophomore, redshirt sophomore year, there was a couple injuries and it kind of bumped me up and I was willing to block. I mean, why not? I mean, I'm getting a chance to play for Penn state. I'll block. I don't care. <laughs> uh, and that helped me get on the field. And then we go to Ohio state and uh, they called a play. And I think honestly, they looked out at me and they're like, well, he's only ever blocked. They're not throwing him the ball and they didn't cover me. Um, and fortunately Daryl Salton threw it to me and that was kind of my first play in, in meaningful time. And, that's all I needed was one, one shot. And I mean, that's all anybody needs. If, if they're at their dream school and you get one chance, you got to seize it. All those years ago, that's one of the things I've always loved and appreciated about Penn state was that the players never cared. If you were five, four, three, two, one star, zero star, whatever it was, it didn't matter because they saw what you were doing every single day. They saw who you were every single day. 
in the weight room, in the film room, in the practice field as a person getting reps before practice, getting reps after practice, right? They didn't care. I mean, you know, maybe some coaches felt differently, but the, it didn't matter to the players, right? They knew who can get the job done. They knew what players should be in there contributing and helping their team win, whatever that role may be. You know, guys, we had, we had Trace McSorley on last week on the show. And I said to him, he was the type of player that Penn state needed a tough, a smart, a something to prove player that was not going to leave the program during tough times or difficult times. He would stay and fight things, both that you, you, both of you guys have done. Um, and I mentioned this earlier, so I'm going to ask, I'll ask Brett first and then to Graham, does it take a special player or a special person or just a different person in general to play at Penn state and really understand what it means to wear that brand? I think so. I mean, you look at what came before us and there was no names in the back of our jerseys because it wasn't about our names as individuals. It was about the team. And there's a plenty of places in college football that that's not the case, but it, there's not many that have it set up like that. And that itself, when you see that on game days, when you see the traditional jerseys, it, it's just different. And you have to have a mentality that you want to be there for the team. You're, you're there for whatever it takes to help the team win. Um, you know, when, when Joe did an early squad meeting, I, I still, it's vivid memory of me, you know, him asking each freshman down the line, give us your accolades. And, you know, the first few guys would stand up and both put the chest out a little bit and say, you know, when our, our class, Graham, I mean, how many uh, high school Americans do we have? And I'm sitting here like, oh, God, all of them. <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was all state in Jersey. I thought that was OK. And by the time it got to me, it was like, I don't want to say anything. This is silly. Like, so anyway, you get to the end and Joe was like, well, behind you is a, an actual college All-American that's already earned this. And, you know, starts pointing out guys like, listen. So whatever you brought into this room, it doesn't matter. You start all over and you earn it on that practice field. You earn it throughout the workouts. And that's just the mentality that they shot you straight along the process. And you knew that's what you had to do to get there and be successful. And it was a little bit different, but um, I think that's, what's made us successful um, from that program continuing years and years. Cause that tradition started many years ago and it just continues to go. Like you said, you, you mentioned that you looked up to Graham and I, um, or, and many other guys in our class and years before you, that, that, that gap where there's, you know, guys graduating, classes coming in, and I mentioned that it's not like a turnstile. You're there, you become family, and you learn from each other. That happens, it keeps going over and over and over again. It just stuck through the program, and it's what's made it so great. Yeah. What do you think, Graham? Yeah, I mean, for me, I knew it was, I knew it was something special and real when I was there on my recruiting visit, and I think I was there with Zach Frazier, a quarterback recruit out of Mechanicsburg, and then Pat Devlin was the other one. And I was the third one to walk up and we we're going into uh, the Joe's office and uh, I'll never forget. And it set the tone for how the program was run and how it was going to be there. But Joe comes out of his office, walks right by Pat and his parents, walks right by Zach and his parents and comes to me and my parents. And I, I'm pissed. You know, I love Penn State. I'm like, what are you doing? You're going to lose these two top quarterback <laughs> recruits. You're absolutely nuts. And he comes by and he shakes my hand and says my parents' name, says hi to them, and, you know, gives us 10 minutes to talk. And then he goes back to Zach and then to Pat. And, like, it drove me nuts. I couldn't figure out why he was doing it. And and he did lose, um, I guess, Zach. And then probably when you committed Brett, he probably went elsewhere due to, you know, Pat and Brett. I mean, who wants a third quarterback? But he went elsewhere. And, uh, you know, I started thinking about it. And later on, I got the opportunity to ask Joe, I was like, how'd you do it? And he said, because everybody needed another place. And going off what you said, Matt, about the star rankings, Joe didn't know about the star rankings. He didn't care about the star rankings. And um, that set the tone. I, I was a nobody, man. And there's this, what was it, top, top, what were you guys, top five quarterbacks in the nation and stuff? And he walks right by him and his parents and uh, comes, to, comes to some dude that's just going to be a preferred walk-on. So right there I knew this is a special place. And then obviously – you get out there in front of the fans and you start talking and you go to Florida for a bowl game and there's Penn State alum everywhere. I mean, there's so much history before we got there and there's going to be so much history after we've been there. Uh, uh, Matt, I'm trying to remember who it was. Was it Zordich that we had on the show? And, and Mike Zordich Jr. was saying that he had very little say in his recruiting because Joe basically just won over his parents. <laughs> like I've heard this story so many times and it's just such an old school thing of just like, yeah, I'll win over mom and dad and maybe grandpa and grandma if I have to and siblings if I have to. But that was 
that was Joe, and he just wanted that family mentality uh, within the football programs. I, I, I love hearing those stories. Yeah. Um, Brett, I want to ask you because, like, you both get there in 2006. You're, you obviously talked about how you were recruited. Um, I have a fond memory of that, obviously, because 2006, Penn State wins the Orange Bowl, beat Florida State, uh, Paterno versus Bowden. It, it was a huge game, and it was a huge turning point for the program overall because early in the 2000s, those were some thin years, rough years. People were calling for uh, for Joe Paterno to step down as head coach. There were a number of things, and then uh, Paul Pazlozny and company really led the team back, and then um, you guys get there in 2006, and it was some pretty solid years there for a while. And it's so funny to see the ebb and flow in terms of the team was down a little bit early 2000s, came back up with you guys. Then obviously McGloin and company ran into the struggles that they ran into there in 2011, 2012, just to see the way things, you know, you guys got very lucky during those four years that you were there, that everything was so good. When you walked in and that success had been reached, was that daunting at all? I think it was exciting because there was, like you said, there was a little bit, there was a couple of years where Penn State was being counted out. And um, I believe it was like the recruiting class before us with Derek Williams and Justin King um, that matched up with some of these like just tough, hard-nosed guys that have been there and fought through those difficult years. You combine some young and athletic and energetic and exciting players with some of those guys that grinded through some really tough years. Like you said, Buzz Lesney and those guys, like there were some tough years at Penn State football. They, they grinded through and it, it sharpened them. You put those together, it really kind of created this electric opportunity. And, um, you know, that I remember, I remember watching the Orange Bowl on TV. I had committed many months before and I just, it was exciting. It wasn't, it was just like, we have an opportunity to, keep this program now where they brought it back to and, and, and keep it where it belongs. Cause we had committed, we, we all decided to go there because we knew how great it was, not just the football program, the university, everything about it. And um, I, I didn't feel like it was daunting. What was daunting was walking into that stadium on a game day for the first time in a night game, my freshman year, I think it was maybe Michigan. I'm so thankful I redshirted because boy, I think I watched the stands more than I watched the game that day because it was <laughs> incredible. Like there was like 300 people at my high school games just to, to see that crowd for the first few games. I was grateful for a red shirt for that reason only. Just a chance to sit and absorb that madness. And trust me, I've been in that student section, so I have a, a comprehension <laughs> of how wild it gets. Um, Graham, for, for you, you know, you had the op opportunity to do, you know, your entire college career in lockstep with Brett. Um, but you guys, you know, we talked about before we hopped on here, um, the, the, the name Derek Moy jumps to mind and you guys never really had like, and it's nothing against any one of you. It's not like there was that one, that this is the number one receiver or anything like that. Everybody was a plausible option at any given time. Was that ever just clearly communicated? Was it ever said, hey, this is the number one option within the offense? Or was it just kind of, hey, whoever's open gets the ball? It didn't need to be communicated. I think we were all fine with spreading the ball around. And and I, I mean, like Brett said earlier, if, if he did something good, I was going to be there to celebrate. And I can tell you the exact same the other way. Or if Moy or I mean, whoever. I mean, it didn't matter if it was Chaz Powell in the end zone or if it was some freshman in the end zone. We were celebrating. We didn't care. I mean, obviously – you always want to have success and you want to touch the ball because that's fun. But I mean, you can touch the ball a hundred times and lose the game and you're not having fun. And it's, it's, it's a bottom line. I mean, winning the game is what's fun. Winning the game is what's important to all of us. And that's why we were all recruited to go there. Um, so it's just how it is. I mean, there was never a clear cut number one in our offense. I mean, I don't think anybody was a clear cut number one either. I don't think any of us were meant to handle. I mean, I know my body couldn't handle getting hit a hundred times um, throughout the season. Brett probably could. I mean, he was, he was built and he's big, but you look at Moy and I, I mean, we're running around there at like 177 pounds and there's D linemen that are 300 pounds and we can't, we can't handle a hit from them every single week. So um, I think spreading the ball around was good. And we all had our, our, our certain, whatever that made us special to the offense or make it made us help the offense. So I, I think it was the perfect oper operation going in with that offense and kind of how we, we were each built to help each other out. I mean, Matt, you can speak to we Yeah. I mean, your shortest receiver was what? Six me at six, three. Well, that's, that's the thing too. You that, <laughs> like you look, you look at that 2010 team, like those wide receivers. I mean, you had like, uh, as a quarterback, I had five, six wide receivers that I fully trusted. 
yeah. and knowing what they were doing. And you mentioned like, you mentioned Brett. It's funny. Cause like now it's like the summertime. So I, I think back all the time to like treadmill tests and 300s so or Brett was able to run for days. So like who, who's going to be the best 300s was Brett treadmill test, you know, couldn't conditioning drills, anything like that. Uh, but um, you know, but yeah, like it, it never mattered to me. Like it, it, who was playing the X, who was playing the Z, who was playing tight end, who was playing the slot, whatever it was, like the offense dictate, dictates where you go with the football. And for you to be a good passing team, to have a good passing attack, anybody can get the ball at any time, depending on coverage. And people do, you have to have guys you can trust, guys that can play, guys that understand their role, know what their job was. And that's why we had that. We had a pretty, pretty good passing attack there in, in, in 2010, which, um, you know, which was a, uh, you know, it was a good year and up and down year, special year. Um, but I mean, a well, lot of guys, a lot of guys that can play. Yeah. And Matt, I mean, honestly, I mean, the other thing is, I mean, Brett and I could line up and we knew we weren't going to get the ball on a certain play and we knew it might go to like Moy. We're like looking out and we're like, man, he's getting the ball on this one, but it didn't matter. We still have to run our route right to open it. Yeah. And that's, what's missed a lot of times is like, you know, when somebody else gets the ball, it's because three other dudes ran the correct route to, to draw on the defense and open that other guy. And, um, you know, sometimes that was fun being like the quote decoy guy. Um, you know, seeing how many guys you could draw to you thinking you were getting the ball. Um, and that was sometimes the fun stuff is seeing, yeah. seeing that and seeing how open you could get somebody else doing it. And, and, you know, for Brett being the tight end spot, that happened, that could happen a lot. You know, one of the, uh, let me, I want to change directions here real quick. Um, you know, because I guess I think one of the themes like of this show thus far and just just having this conversation, you know, Tom, I'm thinking, I think you're getting a pretty good sense of it is like how, how close those Penn state teams were, you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. how much pride those guys took in to, to being great teammates, understanding the importance of the school, the university, the program, and just how special it was to wear that blue and white, um, you know, every single Saturday. So, so Graham, I'll start with you and then I'll go to you, Brett, you know, when you, from where the day you left the program to now, I guess, Happy, frustrated. What, what direction do you want to see this program go in? What could the future look like? Because I just mentioned, let's be honest. I don't think the connection from when we left the program to now is as strong as it should be. No, I think, you know, and I think that's difficult too, when you have a new head coach in there, I think that's going to be difficult to keep that connection going with all the lettermen and, and, and all that. But, you know, and things have changed in the locker room. I mean, what do we have carpet and wood lockers? Now they got TVs and every year. But, <laughs> I mean, I haven't been back to see it, but um, I've seen the pictures and stuff. So, you know, for us, it, I mean, it never even crossed my mind of having some of the things they have now, but you know, now they need a lot of those things to help with the recruiting. I mean, kids look at that stuff and they're like, man, I can have an Xbox in my locker. I mean, this is, I'm in. Um, so I wouldn't say it's frustration. I think it's just, we're probably all a little jealous, to be honest. I mean, some of those things are pretty cool. Um, but at the same time, looking back, some of the things that we didn't have, I think that's what made us close as, as, as brothers in the locker room and brothers on the field. I think there's little details that were left out and, and provided to us and forced upon us, um, made us tight, made us trust each other, and made us play for the one beside us. How about you, Brett? I know, I know, I, I know that's a tough question to ask guys, but it's just, you know, I, I don't want that Penn state football, like type player mentality. I don't want that to disappear with, with the way college football is changing. Right. You know what I mean? I just want year in and year out. I want these student athletes to understand just how special it is to be yeah. a part of that school, to be a part of that university, to be a part of the program and not look past like, how good of a career you can have playing four or five years at Penn state. That's all. Yeah. I think there's a lot of things that are just different in, in today's college football, but what, what I'm fortunate enough to be able to see is in working with uplifting athletes and, and the chapter at Penn state that has been there since 2003, doing these lift for lives and raising money for uh, people impacted by various diseases. And I get to see the players that are in the locker room and, and, you know, media, uh, now compared to when we were in college is totally different. Social media now compared to when we were in college, totally different. NIL, these are all things that are really outside of the program, right? That, that have nothing to do with what's inside those walls. But I can tell you, every single one of these guys that I get to meet and get to know, they're dudes that you and I would have the same respect for, go to battle with, 
Um, there is quality young men in that locker room. Now, perception and what's going on and different, you know, all, all that stuff, I don't know what to tell you. But what I when I sit and I talk with those guys and I get to be like, you know, when we're talking about what we're doing for raising money and awareness for rare diseases, it's one thing. But then I, I do, I know I'm, I'm proud of the program. I want to know, like, I want to cheer them on. I want to support them. So I ask questions, you know, like, how is it? How are you guys doing? Like, what's what's going on? And, you know, it's, they are quality young men and they still are, are so focused on the balance of education and, and playing well in the football field and good, being good human beings, right? They, they help the other students move into their, their dorms when, when that time comes around. They get a day off of you know camp, whatever it is, to go help move in. So um, there's a lot of stuff flying and, and you know wins and losses and um, the attention that's on coaches and the staff and the university, all the things that have been going on. Like it's, there's a lot of things flying around. And what I really rest on is when I get a chance to talk to those guys, I'm telling you, they are quality young men and they would be – I would be proud to be their teammate, have their back, and, and and be on the field going going for the win on Saturdays with them. I'm telling you, it's just that is still there. Well said, Brett. Brett and Graham, I appreciate you guys coming on. I've I've thoroughly enjoyed uh, being a fly on a wall for this reunion. Um, before we go, Brett, you mentioned name, image, and likeness, NIL benefits. Graham, I'll start with you. And this is a PG show, remember. If you were still playing at Penn State and you had name, image, and likeness benefits, who would you want to be sponsoring Graham Zug? First off, I was a nobody, remember? So I'm not getting <laughs> Oh, come on. So, so I'll say this. I'll go with my dad. I'll, I'll go Zug Family Dental. He would have sponsored me. Smart. <laughs> Smart. Uh, no, honestly, I, I don't even know what to think about that um, or, or how you'd even approach it. I, I, you know, honestly, part of me feels kind of bad for these guys to have to figure it, figure it all out and try and go through it all while they have academics. They have everything that's required of them in, in football and, um, you know, more business and all that stuff. So, um, but no, if I had to pick one person, it would have been my dad's business. Uh, that's a good know, answer. I, I, feel, I feel bad now. That's a really good wholesome <laughs> answer. I appreciate that. I was, <laughs> so like, if it had been me, I'd have picked "Are You Hungry?" because I was getting sandwiches there every single weekend. So it probably it probably would have been uh, who we go to all the time. Brett wings over. Wings over. Oh, that was it. Man. That was it. It yeah. probably would have been them. Do they get sponsored the post game meal for us? What do you think? Yeah, that would have been great. God, that would have been amazing. Oh my gosh. Brett, Graham, thank you so much for joining us and best of luck in everything you guys have going on in life. Appreciate you guys coming on the show. And thank you all so much for joining us. We'll be back on ESPN State College next Thursday, again, from 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern. If you want to check out the podcast version of this show presented by the Believe Network, this episode and our entire library of shows is available now on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever else you get your podcasts. And of course, let us know what you think of the show on Twitter at ESPN Radio 1037 at McGloin QB11 and at Tom Hannafin. Thanks again, everyone. Join us next week and hit Pater.